there we go. Question says, in the circle shown below, chords TR and QS intersect at P, which is the center of the circle. And the measure of angle PST is 30 degrees. What is the degree measure of minor arc RS? So let me zoom in a little bit here. Circle below chords TR, QS intersect at P. So P is the center of our circle. That enables us to, to note that PQ, PR, PT, PS are all radii, since they're all emanating from the center of the circle. And if they're all radii, <clears throat> then we know that they're all um, the same length. So let's look down here at this triangle, oops, this triangle here. They tell us that if you look at PS and PT, we know they're the same length. <clears throat> so we have an isosceles triangle here. So if that angle in the bottom right is 30 degrees, that means that this angle here is also 30 degrees. That's 30 degrees. We know the sum total of our angles of a triangle are 180. So if we have a 30 degree, oops, if we have a 30 degree angle on the bottom right, a 30 degree angle on the bottom left, that's 60. We know they must add up to 180. So this last angle must be 120. I'm trying to fit that all in there. That angle is 120. The vertical angle right across from it is 120. And ultimately, let's think about what we're looking for here. It says, what is the degree measure of minor arc RS? So we're looking for that angle where the, right, where the question mark is. We know that the, the um, angle in degrees that would be represented by that would be this, this angle RPS. Talking about right, this angle right in here in blue. And we know that this is a straight line here, QS, that's a diameter. So it's 180 degrees. So if angle QPR right here is 120, to add up to 180, this angle RTS, which is what they're asking for this arc, must be 60. That is answer H. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. This one's a little bit quicker. We're on page 135 here. It says the circle above with stenner O has a circumference of 36. What is the length of minor arc AC? So they tell us our circumference here, given is 36. When we're thinking about circumference, we should remember, write our, our formula for circumference. C is equal to diameter times pi. Shouldn't really need that here, but it might be might come into play. So we're looking at the length of minor arc AC. Looking at this arc right up there. So if we know that that angle AOC it's perpendicular, it's 90 degrees. 90 degrees is one fourth the number of degrees of a circle, right? A circle is 360 degrees. So if our, if our um, angle of interest is 90 degrees, the area of our circle is 360 degrees. So this is the angle of our arc over the total angle of the circle is equal to the arc length that we're looking for, we'll call that x, over the, what you can think of as the total arc length, which is just the um, circumference, it's the perimeter of the circle, which is given to us as 36. We could do some simple multiplication here. We also can see that the relationship between um, this 360 degrees to get to 36, we would just divide by 10. So to make that jump from 90 to x, we should also just divide by 10. 90 divided by 10 would be x, but let's be sure about this. So if we cross multiplied here, ninety times thirty-six is equal to x times three sixty. We'll solve for x. 
So I'm going to divide by 360. Divide by 360 here. These zeros will cancel out, right? I'm just dividing by 10. My 36s will cancel out. And x is equal to 9. That makes sense. That angle of interest in the circle was 90 degrees. It's one fourth of the circle. So if we just divide that um, circumference by 4, take one fourth of it, we get 9. So our answer here is A. And that was uh, number two on page 135. Page 136 here. Another question about arcs, circumferences, uh, circle angles. So it says in the circle above, point A is the center and the length of arc BC. So we're talking about this arc here, right? Remember, that's just the, just the section, just the specific portion of our circumference of the circle. The circle above point A is the center and the length of arc BC is two fifths of the circumference of the circle. What is the value of X? So we see that this angle X right, corresponds to the angle of that arc. And so the relationship between the angle and the arc would be that the angle is, is like the, the cut of the circle we have, or the, the, the um, fraction of the circle's degrees, the percentage of the circle's degrees, would be the same thing as the relationship to the arc of the circumference. So we're just looking at a certain cut. So we know that the total angle of our circle is 360 degrees. They tell us that this arc is two fifths of the circumference. The circumference would be the total perimeter of our circle. So our angle should also be two fifths of the total. So if we just take two fifths of 360 degrees, multiply that by two fifths. You put this into your calculator. Two times 360 would be 720. And we're going to divide that by five. We get 144 degrees. Okay, that was number one. Oops, number 20. Let's move on to the next page here. Let's see, that was 136. Yep, we'll get 137 here. No arcs really in this one, or no, no questions about arcs. It says point B is the center of the circle and the figure above. What is the value of X? So we're looking specifically for that angle X there, right off the um, radius, right off the center of our circle. If we know that that's the center of our circle, then that line PB must be a radius. That line PC must also be a radius. We could also draw another line. We could draw another line like just this line here. Yep, like that. That's another radius. So let's look at this triangle APB up here at the top. That's a radius. And these lines are equal to each other. Those lengths are equal to each other. And that's angle 20. Then this angle X, I'm sorry, this angle PAB must also be 20. You know, the sum total of angles in a triangle is 180. So we can take 180 minus 20, minus 20. We know that this angle APB, sorry, APB, right, must be equal to 140. Let's see a little bit. This angle here is 140. Now this triangle down here on the bottom is just the same, but <clears throat> I 
So if we draw that again, once again, this length, this length, angle PCA is 20 degrees, angle PAC is also 20 degrees. This inner angle here is 140. We know that the total degree of angles in a circle should be 360. So if we look here, this little like inner circle I'm drawing, we know that the angles that map must add up to 360 are 140, 140, and X. One forty plus one forty plus X three sixty. So we get two eighty plus X. Let's go to three sixty. Subtract two eighty. X then is equal to eighty degrees. That's our angle. There's a couple different ways to maybe go about that one. Um, you know, we just we're given a piece of, of uh, logic or information right off the bat. In this case, that's knowing that P is in the center of our circle. And given that, we can go from there and start making, right, start making um, uh, inferences and true statements based off that. Let's keep moving here. Let's see, we've done about four problems in this section. Let's look at number uh, 34 here. What is this? This is page. 138. So it says point C is the center of the circle above. What fraction of the area of the circle is the area of the shaded region? So we don't know the overall area of the circle, but that's fine here because all they're asking us is to talk about the, is to find the fraction of the area. We're just finding a, a ratio, we're not finding the actual number, just a ratio. So we know that the total degree of angles in a circle are 360, again. We know that the total area of the circle would be pi r squared. Not, not relevant for us though, because we're just talking about the, the fraction, the, the uh, portion of the circle that's shaded. So the region that would be represented by this 100 degree angle cut would just be 100 degrees divided by the total, um, the total angle or the total degrees of a circle, 360. Just a ratio, so it's 100 over 360. We want to simplify this. We could, that is the right answer, but a, a more uh, simple fraction would probably be a little bit better. So if I divided both numbers by 10, right, if I crossed off these zeros here, I'd get 10 over 36. We could simplify that one step further. Both of those numbers are even. We could divide both by two. If we divide 10 by two, we get five. And if we divide 36 by two, we get 18. Oops, rewrite that here. We divide 36 by two, we get 18. So the fraction of the shaded region the fraction of the shaded region, the fraction of the area of this shaded region represents 5 eighteenths of the circle's overall area. Okay, let's do, let's see, not 1045, let's do this one and then we'll move on to some um, triangle related problems. So this question, number 36, they're on page 139. So actually, let's do, Let's do this one, number 140 here. Page 140, number 24. It says in the circle above, segment AB is a diameter. If the length of arc ADB so we're looking here, arc ADB <clears throat> is eight pi, What is the length of the radius of the circle? So let's think about this. If this segment AB is a diameter, that means that this cuts our circle in half, right? We have two semicircles. 
this circle, um, ADB would be one half of the circle, eight pi, and then the other, let's say we you know, had some point just for naming purposes here, C, if our other arc, ACB, would have been the same, the same um, length as the other side of the circle, just, just flipped, right? So this other side must also be eight pi, but that tells us that the overall circumference of our circle, C must be equal to 16 pi. Using that, we know there's a relationship between circumference and diameter. And then from there, we know there's a relationship between diameter and the radius. So we know that the formula for circumference is diameter times pi. So let's solve for diameter. We said our circumference was 16 pi. So C is equal to 16 16 pi. That's equal to our diameter times pi. So if we divide by pi, so we just want to solve for diameter. We see that our diameter is 16. The question is not asking for the diameter though. So right, I mean, if we look at the answer for D, 16, we want to we want to be careful. <clears throat> We're looking for the radius of the circle. Our radius is equal to one half the diameter, or we can say that the diameter is twice the length of the radius. So we know that the diameter is equal to two times the radius. So we plug in for D, 16 is equal to two times the radius. Divide by two. Divide by two. and our radius is now equal to eight. That's our answer. Let's see. So lots of, you know, this section was all just um, specific geometry related problems to circles. So angles and, and radii, diameter, um, circumference, lots of, lots of good questions there. So now let's move on to some triangle related problems. Scroll down here. Let's look. We are on page 152. It's number 18. Give me a second to get there. It's 18. It says in the figure above, BD, this line BD here, is parallel to AE. What is the length of CE? So they also give us a length for BD. They tell us that that length is six. It's also that length for AE is 18. They're asking us to find the length of CE. So we know with, the, with these similar triangles, we know that their, um, their, their lengths are, are in proportion to each other. So let's look here at this. Let's look here at this smaller triangle, CBD. Also, I believe this, this problem was um, done last week, so we're just looking at this to review quick. So now we're looking at the triangle C, B, D. If we know that line B, D and A, E are parallel, and we know that this angle B, A, E here is 90 degrees, that means that this angle here, C, B, D, must also be 90 degrees. So that means we have a right triangle there. Some of the um, Pythagorean triples of a right triangle that we should know. One is three, four, five. Talking about the, the lengths of their side and then the length of the hypotenuse. Three, four, five is one. If we double three, four, five, we get six, six, eight, 10. We see that two of our legs here are six and eight. So that means that the length of this hypotenuse, CD, must be 10. We could also do the, the um, uh, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, the Pythagorean theorem. Solve for that side. But if we can uh, recognize that that's a triple right off the bat, it saves us a lot of time. So that's good. So we have that length CD. Now, 
we want to see what exactly are these two um, triangles that they're comparing. Um, so they say, these two are parallel. What is the length of CE? So we're interested in CE, which if we see here, is the hypotenuse right, of this larger circle. We have the hypotenuse of this inner circle, which is similar to the larger circle. Right, we have the hypotenuse of this inner circle. So we can just set up a simple proportion. Before here. Check this down. So the length of BD to AE six or eighteen. So again, that's side BD over AE. Just in parentheses here, just signifying the where I'm getting these numbers from. So six is to 18 as 10, the hypotenuse of this inner circle is two. 10 is our length CD as 10 is to what? We're looking for this length, but that's not that remainder DE, that's the entire thing CE. So we're going to have to find the entire length of that and then take 10 away for it. If we wanted to solve for CD, they're just asking us here, though, for CE. Just important to be um, specific or, or realize what it is exactly that they're, they're asking for here. <clears throat> so 10 is CD. And this X that we're looking for here is C. Oh, we cross multiply, we get 6x is equal to 18 times 10 is 180. Divide by 6. Divide by 6. x is equal to. That's our answer. So this length CE, this hypotenuse of our larger circle here, is equal to 30. Okay, this is page 153 now. So we have this quadrilateral, A, B, C, D. They tell us that segment A, D and B, C are parallel. So we know A, D here at the bottom, parallel with that segment B, C at the top. So that also tells us that we know if um, BCD, we know if that's a 90 degree angle. You know, this angle here must also be 90 degrees. And they also tell us that CD is equal to one half the length of AB. So this CD, this right side here, is one half this, the length of this further side, AB. Okay. So how can we do this? So let's, let's draw, drop a line down from B down, and let's make this line from B here, I'll call this point um, X, just for reference, and we're saying that this line BX and CD are parallel. Then we know that this must be a right angle and this must be a right angle. Okay, so that's helpful. Now we're interested in finding the measure of angle B. So we want this angle in here. That's the question. What, what is the um, value of that angle? So if we see 
we know that all these angles in here in this BCDX, this square, must be 90 degrees. We know that this must be a right triangle here. So we have a right triangle here and we give away that this line CD is one half AB. We know that BX and CD are parallel and they're clearly here of the same length. So we also know that the line BX is one half AB. So let's, let's try and put this in a, in a simpler sense. If the line BX is one half AB, right, it's half as great as AB. Let's see, let's say AB has a length of two X. If the line BX is half the length of AB, then that means that the length of BX must just be X. So if that is X and this line is two X, we see that that's the hypotenuse of this right triangle. That should jump out to us. We have a right triangle where the hypotenuse is twice as long as one of the legs, we have a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And more importantly, so we want to specify which angle is the 30 or the 60. The smaller leg in a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, the smaller leg is half the hypotenuse. So if this, this is getting a little bit, Long in here, let me put that in red there. So we're calling this leg X. We're trying to find this angle in here. That leg is half the length of the hypotenuse. That means that the angle that it is opposite across must be the smallest angle in the 30, 60, 90. So that means that this angle must be 30 degrees. And that angle is 30 degrees. We have a 30, 60, 90. This must be our 60 degree angle. This angle A, B, X. But let's be careful. They're not asking us for the overall, um, they're not asking us for this A, B, X. They're asking for the measure of angle B, which is something like A, B, C. So we see though that that's the sum of a 60 degree angle and a 90 degree angle. We add those two together, 60 plus 90 equal to 150 degrees. Our answer is A. Okay. Let's see that's page 153. Let's move down here on page 154. This is number 12. It says, in the figure above, triangle ABC, given here on the left, is similar to triangle DEF. So if they're similar, we know that they have the same, um, the same values for their angles. The, the um, sides, the lengths are different though. So, and they tell us specifically ABC, is similar to DEF. So the, the, the way they describe the, similar, the triangle um, and being similar is obviously important. We need to follow that same direction. They're obviously also oriented here the same way. So this makes sense to us. We have a right triangle here on the left. They tell us 5, 12. We have 5, 12, and 13 as the lengths of the sides. That's another um, uh, triple. So the question is, what is the value of cosine of E? So if we look here, we can see that this angle E, angle E corresponds or is similar to angle B. This angle E in here is similar to this angle B. And they're asking us what the value of the cosine of E is. So we know for Trig functions, sine, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, ka, so ka, and tangent, toa, tangent is opposite over adjacent. 
we're only interested here in cosines. We know that the cosine of this triangle E, the cosine of this angle E can be represented by the adjacent leg over the hypotenuse. Now it seems like, well, we don't have the, the lengths of the sides there. We don't need them. Cosine is just a relationship of angles. So the cosine of this angle E should be the same as the cosine of that angle B because they're describing the same ratio, they're describing the same proportion. So we can say that cosine of B will be equal to the cosine of E. We don't have the, the legs, we don't have the lengths for triangle um, DEF, but we do have them for triangle ABC. So let's fill this in for triangle ABC. If we're talking about the cosine of B, over here, this triangle on the left, we need the adjacent side, which is 12. So the cosine of B, I'm talking about cosine, adjacent over hypotenuse, that is 12 over our, our hypotenuse, our longest side, 13. So cosine of B is equal to 12 over 13. And we said that the cosine of B, since it's a similar triangle, ABC is the DEF, that that must be the same thing for cosine E. So we're saying that cosine E is also equal to 12 over 13. You can see here that that is answer B. Now we're at number 27. We are on page 155 of the PDF. So if we remember a 45, 45, 90, right triangle means that we have an isosceles right triangle. They tell us here. So these sides, these legs are equal. These angles are equal. If those are angles are equal, then this must be a 45. This must be a 45. These legs are equal. Call them X and X. And it's also this hypotenuse, we'll call it C, is equal to eight times the square root of two. The relationship between the um, legs of a 45, 45, 90 right triangle and the hypotenuse is that the hypotenuse is the value of the hypotenuse is equal to the value of one of the legs times the square root of two. So if C is equal to eight times the square root of two, since C is equal to X length of um, leg X times the square root of two, and we know that the value for C is eight times the square root of two, we want to solve for the value of that leg X because we're looking for the perimeter, so we need the lengths of all the sides. So we divide by the square root of two here to solve for X. X is equal to eight. So that's that leg on the left, that leg on the right. Now we have the lengths of all of our sides. So to find the perimeter, we just need to add them all up. So we have eight plus eight plus eight times the square root of two. We want to combine like terms. So we have 16 plus eight times the square root of two. Like I said, that idea, that idea of 45, 45, 90 right triangles, that sounds familiar. You can, you know, let me know in the chat. You can either send me, send me a message, give me a thumbs up, or, or let's look at 156 here, number 19. It says in triangle ABC above, what is the length of AD? So we're looking here for this length AD. We'll call that X. And, well, once again, we see we have one angle, 30. We see we have another angle, 60. We also see we have a right triangle there. 
So once again, good chance here that we'll be using some 30, 60, 90 relationships. So let's look at this triangle. B, D, C first. So we see that that angle D is a right triangle. I'm sorry, it's a right angle. It's 90 degrees. That angle DCB is 60. So this angle DBC at the top must be 30. So we have a right triangle there. And more specifically, we have a 30, 60, 90. So remember, we said that within a, uh, the confines of a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, the length of the shorter leg is half the length of the hypotenuse. So the shorter leg in this triangle, BDC, must be this length, DC. Right, because it's opposite the smallest angle, it's opposite this 30 degree angle here. So this length DC must be half as long as that hypotenuse BC. Half as long as 12 means that this length is six. So DC is equal to six. That is one of the answers, but we can't just assume automatically that that length DC is equal to the length AD. I mean, we know they look it looks like it, but we haven't really been able to prove that just yet. So let's think about what we have here first. We know that the sum total of this angle ABC up here at the top, talking about this, this angle in this corner, it's 30 plus 30, that's 60. So that angle is 60. This angle on the bottom right is 60. And if we're looking at the entire triangle, the biggest triangle ABC here, we have 60, 60. That last angle, angle BAC, must also be 60, right? They must add up to 180. And now we can, we can definitely determine <clears throat> that that last angle in there, ADB, must be 90 degrees. We knew that AAC looks like a straight line, but you know, it wasn't exactly given. So all the sum totals, all the angles in triangle ADB are filled out. And we can see now that we have an equilateral triangle. And we also know that this is a, um, give, given that, we know that this line BD must be bisecting this segment AC because the angles ABD and DBC are congruent. They're both 30. So now we know that angle or length X must be equal to the length um, DC, which is six, so X, now we know for sure is six. Okay, and let's look at this one here on page 157, number 23, and then we'll move on out of this section. So it says, in the figure above, triangle ACD is a right triangle, and segment BE is parallel to segment CD. What is the perimeter of triangle ACD, so our entire, our biggest triangle here, to the nearest tenth of a unit? So it's gonna be similar to that other problem we worked with. Where's that one? There's 152. This one, where we know we have like a, a triangle embedded within a triangle and we can make some relationships from there. We know that um, they must be similar and from there we can start making uh, proportionalities from one length to another. right here, I'm 23. So it says in the figure above, triangle ACD is a right triangle, and BE is parallel to CD. So this BE and CD, if that's parallel, then that angle BCD, 90 degree angle, means that this other angle, ABE, ABE excuse me, is a right angle. We're looking for the perimeter of the entire thing ACD. So there's a couple lengths we need to figure out, right? We need to figure out what this length BC is. We need to figure out what this length AED or AD is. 
So we need to find out what BC is. And this hypotenuse of the biggest triangle, AD. What is that? We have the base, otherwise we have that smaller section of the line AC. We have that AB equal to five, so we need to go from there. So let's look at this triangle up here at the top. In this triangle, ABE, if we know one leg is three and another leg is five, um, you know, it would be helpful to know what this what this AE is. Well, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. C squared, or the C there, referring to our AE or our, our hypotenuse. So if we plug in our first leg, A squared, five squared would be five squared. B would be three. Three squared is equal to C squared. Five squared is 25. 3 squared is 9, that's equal to c squared. 25 plus 9 gives us 34, that's equal to c squared. So to solve for c, which is take the square root of both sides, c is equal to the square root of 34. So let's leave that there for now. They do tell us in the question, they say, what is the perimeter to the nearest tenth of a unit? So there's a good chance that we should be getting numbers that you know aren't exactly perfect, but we're going to be getting some decimals and we might have to round. Right, they say nearest tenth of the unit, good hint that we're going to be having to round. So let's leave this AE up here. We'll just keep, keep it for now as the square root of 34. When we need a specific value for it, then we can go ahead and do it then. Okay. So that hypotenuse, AE, is in proportion to the hypotenuse of the bigger triangle, right? We know that this smaller triangle, ABE, is similar to triangle ABE is similar to triangle ACD. So that means that there must be some relationship between that hypotenuse AE and the bigger hypotenuse, AD. We see that this line, BE, they tell us it's three. When we, when we scale it up to so the bigger triangle, it becomes nine, becomes CD. Right now we're, we're solving for the hypotenuse, BE over CD, and so that's three over nine. So the corresponding um, hypotenuse there for the smaller triangle ABE would be that hypotenuse that we just found, square root of 34. Over X, we don't know what that is. So we can see that to go from three to nine, we had to multiply by three. So to go from the square root of 34 to x, we're going to have to multiply by 3. So this, this hypotenuse that we're not sure about, this AD, must just be 3 times the square root of 34. Let me try out some of this math here. I should have left myself some more room. So this entire length here. times the square root of 34, okay? So we have the hypotenuse, we have this leg down here at the bottom, nine, CD. Now we just need to find this last length, BC on the side, then we have all the sides of our triangle, we can add them up and find the perimeter. Okay, so once again, we're gonna use a, a simple proportion, trying to think about these numbers. What exactly is related to what? So we see that this length AB, five, is one of the legs, this like back, we could say, of, the, of this right triangle is five. So five, let's say five is to that, that strip AB, 
is the AC, what we're looking for. Call that X. So line AC here, call that X. Five is to X. Five is to X as, let's say, use that same relationship. Three is to nine. Once again, we're going to scale everything up by three. So go from three to nine, we have to multiply by three. So to go from five to X, we're going to multiply by three. That tells us X is equal to 15. So this length here is 15. So the lengths of our, lengths of our triangle here, we have 15 plus nine. And then plus that hypotenuse, that was that, that more complex number three times the square root of 34. Use your calculators for this one. So 15 plus nine, you should know that, that's 24. Plus, we'll leave it as three for now, times the square root of 34. Let's find out what that is, 34. The square root is 5.83. I rounded that, right? It's some, it's some long decimal, 5.83095. It's called 5.83. That's close enough for now. So we have 24. We're going to add, we're going to multiply 5.83 by 3. We get 17.49. We add those two numbers together now, and we should have our answer. 24 plus 17.49 gives us. 41.49, they tell us to round it to the nearest tenth of a unit. 41.49 rounded to the nearest tenth means we're looking at this place here. The nine in the hundreds place means move that four up to a five, it up to a five. 41.5 is our answer and perfect. C is 41.5, that's our answer. Okay. That was page 157. Let's jump to some slope problems. So we did circles, we just did triangles, lots of good relationships there in triangles. Definitely, definitely good topics there. SAT, that's probably one of their, their really favorite shapes, I guess, but then the geometry realm of the SAT math, the test. We are in the linear models and the slope section. So page 44, number 19. Says a startup company opened with eight employees. The company's growth plan assumes that two new employees will be hired each quarter, which is every three months, right? We have 12 months in a year. Each quarter, each fourth of the year should be three months. We hired each quarter for the first five years. If an equation is written in the form y equals ax plus b to represent the number of employees y employed by the company X quarters after the company opened, what is the value of B? So let's think about what this is saying. The equation is written in the form Y is equal to AX plus B to represent the number of employees Y opened, employed by the company X quarters after the company opened, what is the value of B? So what we want to do really is, is make sense of this equation. How could this equation, our simple slope formula, Y equals AX plus B or MX plus B, how could that be um, geared towards the, the relationship here or the, um, the parameters of this question? So they tell us here the number of employees Y. Number of employees. They also tell us here, employed by the company X quarters after the company opened. Let's say quarters. How long, you know, how long has the company been open in terms of quarters? And let's look at the other two points of data that they give us. They say the startup company opened with eight employees. 
and they tell us that the company's growth plan assumes that two new employees will be hired each quarter. So that two is kind of bounded to this, this um, period of time of two months of this quarter. So this two is like our slope. This two is saying that each quarter we pick up two new employees, right? Slope says we move over from your point of view, we move over this mount, we go up this mount. So in, in, in relationship to this kind of problem, it says um, each one quarter goes by, we gain two employees. One quarter goes by, we gain two employees. One quarter goes by, we gain two employees. So it's just an application of that. So A, since this is really like our slope, tells us this is two employees. quarter so we figured out what this y is and it's pretty straightforward they told us they figured out what the x was once again straightforward we made sense of that a now what about that b we know that in a in this um, slope formula we know that b is our y intercept and they tell us that y is the number of employees so we were going to try and think about this um, graphically we know that the number of employees i'm just going to call them emp Try and put in there. Would be on the y-axis. They tell us x is quarters. I'm just drawing this graph now to look at this from a different point of view. So we know that the y-intercept is where we start on the y-axis before we move at all off the x-axis. Look at that first sentence. It says a startup company opened with eight employees. Employees are the units of our y-axis, right? That's what we're plotting. How many people uh, do we have in our company? So if we start with eight, right, before any quarters have gone by, we're starting from eight. It's our, it's our, it's, it's our starting position. So this eight here, eight employees represents our y-intercept. You can see that on the graph. And our y-intercept is given by B in our formula, where we intercept the y-axis. So what is the value of B? B is equal to eight. So if we set up a, you know, the complete formula, all we would have to do is plug in the value for A and B. Our formula would be Y, the number of employees is equal to two, the number of employees we pick up each quarter times X, the number of quarters plus the number of employees we start out with eight. So that would be our formula. The question is just asking though, what is the value of B? And we say here that B is equal to eight. Okay, that was page 44. Let's jump down here to page 48. See, we got a coordinate plane here. Good chance we'll be um, asked about slope. It says the graph of Y is equal to MX plus B, where M and B are constants, is shown in the XY plane. Question down here at the bottom says, what is the value of M? We, we used this on the um, previous slide, but what, is, what does M represent? Good, good, Caitlin, M represents our slope. Oops, I'm gonna write that in highlighter. M represents our slope. Heather, good, represents our slope. So they give us the graph, right? They give us like this visual representation of slope. We want to be able to look at this graph and see how can we how can we pull the slope out from it. So one simple equation for our slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So for this for this equation, y2 minus y1 is over x2 minus x1 requires two coordinate pain, two coordinate points. We need one point x1 comma y1, and we need another point x2 comma y2 right just two sets of points and these points obviously need to be on this line so let's go and get two points it doesn't matter which two they are they obviously just need to be different and they need to be on this line but we know that the slope is just a relationship right and that's what we're finding so any two points off this line would satisfy our our, our, our needs here so let's uh let's take this one down here at the bottom let's look at this one the value for this point x value is negative three and our y value is negative two that coordinate point is negative three comma negative two 
Okay, so we can use that one. And let's look, um, let's take this one at the top, the furthest enough that we have here. It's on the y-axis, so we have no x value, right? Our x value here is zero. And we're right there at four on the y-axis. So that point is zero comma four. Okay, so we have our two points. Let's take this to our slope formula that we wrote over here. We just need to be consistent. If we're defining um, zero four, if we're using that as our x1, y1, then we just have to be sure that we use the other, the other point as our x2, y2, right? We just need to be consistent. So let's say that, um, let's say that this zero comma four, we'll say that that is our x1 comma, let's say that this zero four is our x1 comma y1. And then this other one, that other point we found, like I said, we're just being specific. We just want to make sure we define it right and define it in a way that we can go and, and um, consistently implement this into our uh, formula. This would be x2 comma y2. All right, so let's plug these values in. So our formula slope m tells us to take y2. So y2 is given by that bottom coordinate. y2 is negative two. I'm gonna use parentheses here just to separate my numbers, just to make it clear what I'm, you know, what I'm inserting into my equation here. So my y2 is negative two, and I'm going to subtract y1. y1 comes from my other coordinate, that value is four, over x2, that comes from that bottom coordinate again, x2 is negative three, minus x1 comes from that top coordinate, we said that's x1 is zero, So let's do the math here. And be careful, we're gonna take our time <clears throat> to a degree because we got some negative signs and subtraction. We wanna make sure we get our signs right. All right if we flip one, the whole answer is gonna be wrong. So <clears throat> negative two minus four, we get negative six up top. And in the bottom, we get negative three minus zero, just negative three. So our slope M is equal to negative three, negative six over negative three. But we want to simplify that. Negative six divided by negative three is positive two. So our slope m is equal to positive two. Now let's make sense of this. Does that number two, does this make sense for what we see on this graph? Well, it's positive, so we know that overall we should be trending upward, right? As we go from left to right, we should go up. We do. Also, a slope of two, eh, it's not super steep, but it, it's, it's kind of steep, right? A slope of one is like this nice fine balance between your increase horizontal horizontally and you're increased vertically. This is a little bit steeper, right? We're not, we're not nice and smooth, we're a little bit steeper. And a slope of two tells us that we go up two points, our rise over our run, we go up two points for every point that we go over one. So let's take an easy one here. Let's look at this point here. Our rise as we go over one point to the right, we go up two, and then we go to the right to that point one. So that rise of two over one makes sense. Our slope is two. The reason why I did it with this y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 is because we want to be absolutely sure, right? We don't want to, we don't want to, you know, see, well, that looks like a rise of this and a, and a run of this. It's better to be exact here. And when they give us our, our points here and they show us, right, with the two points I circled, we can clearly see that they're, they're um, indicating to us, right, like here, that that circle is filled in, that that is definitely a point at the intersection of negative three comma negative two. So it's better to extract definite points, do the math, get a definite, definite number, and go from there. Okay, that was page 48. To so the next one, page 49, number 27, says in the xy plane above line m, is perpendicular to line L, not shown. Which of the following could be an equation of line L? So we have some line M and we have some line L. Line L is not given, but the relationship that they tell us, relationship between them is important. That relationship, they say that line L, I'm sorry, line M is perpendicular to line L. 
I'm just going to say M is perpendicular to line L. We know that the slope of a line that is perpendicular to another is opposite and reciprocal. So just, I'll write this out more clearly. The slope of L is opposite and reciprocal opposite and reciprocal to the slope of M. So we have the line of we have the line for M here. We can find the slope of M. We have the slope of M. Take the opposite reciprocal slope of it to get the slope of L. And then they give us a few possible equations here that could represent the equation of line L. Given those equations, we could look to see which one has, a, um, has an opposite reciprocal slope to M, and that must be our line. So let's take a look at this line M. The question is to find the slope of M. So similar to how we just did this last one, let's find two definite points where we know that those points are, are for sure at that, at that coordinate. So let's look at this one here. This one stands out to me. You can see that that's right on the y-axis and it's right on that point. So that coordinate would be zero comma three. The other one that stands out to me will be this one right here. If I look on the x-axis, that's one, two, three, four, five. So five comma, and then from three, it's another one, two, three up. So it's five comma six. So we have the points zero comma three and five comma six. Let's use that same formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 and find our slope. x2, we'll call this one. Yes, yeah, for the one we'll call this x2 comma y2. This one here, x1 comma y1. So let's plug that in. And this is the slope m for line m. I'm going to call it m of m. y2 is 6, y1 is 3, x2 is 5, and x1 is 0. So, difference in our y, 6 minus 3 is 3. The difference in our x, 5 minus 0 is 5. So our slope of line m is 3 fifths. Let's, go, let's try and make sense of that. Just a quick check. It's positive, so it's overall trending upward. Definitely is. That makes sense. As we go from left to right, it's going up. And, I mean, 3 fifths is, right, it's 0.6, so it's less than 1. Not too far less than 1. So it's, it's less steep than a slope of, of one would be, but not, not too far off. So yeah, the slope of three-fifths there, that makes sense. Okay, so the slope of, the slope of line M is three-fifths. We're interested in finding the slope of line L, line L, we said must be opposite and reciprocal. So opposite means we flip the sign. Right now it's positive, so our answer will be negative. And needs to be reciprocal. The reciprocal of three fifths, we just flip it, five thirds. So the slope of line L must be negative five thirds. So we're looking for an equation that has a slope of negative five thirds. And that'll be our answer. So let's look down here at our choices. So which of the following could be an equation of line L? So all we want to do is just find the coefficient that's with our x term. Unfortunately, these are not in y equals mx plus b form, but they really shouldn't take too long to get there. So if I look at this first one, 5x plus 3y plus 3 is equal to 0. I'm just going to rewrite this quickly. I leave my y term there. So 3y is equal to negative 5, 6, subtracting that over, minus 3. Divide by 3 here, 
and I'm going to divide the entire right side by three. Not doesn't really matter about the y-intercept here. We're just interested in that coefficient on x. So if we divide that by three, well, that's convenient. We see that right. We we wind up with y is equal to negative five thirds x minus, and then negative three divided by three would be negative one. So the y-intercept's not really um, important here. But we were looking for a slope here. We said of negative 5 thirds, the slope of this line here is given by our m term, right? This fits the form of y is equal to mx plus b. In this case, our m is negative 5 thirds. So it makes sense. So answer A is correct. All right, that was page 49. Let's do a couple more here in this section. Almost done, we got about 15 minutes to go. Let's keep, let's keep pushing. Let's see, this is page 50. Yep, page 50, it says number 32. Line T is shown in the XY plane below. So we got a pretty big graph here and they give us three specific points of, of exact coordinate values. You know, we got some crazy fractions over here. We got negative 27 over um, five, we got a three fifths. So it might get a little dicey with the fractions, but we can make it work. It says, what is the slope of line T? So, I mean, we can clearly see in our graph here, right? Our line is going through points. Our line is going through points here, like uh, that we don't, wanna, we don't wanna guess what they are. So we obviously have to use these coordinates here. Makes sense that that would be why they're um, giving them uh, to us. So <clears throat> to find the slope of line C, once again, we just need to take two points, refer to one as x1, y1, and another one is x2, y2. Do our slope. Good, good, exactly, Yusef. Do our, um, our slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, find our slope. So, um, I mean, you could do it, you could do it if we call this point A, B, and C. You can do A and B, you can do B and C, you can do A and C, it doesn't matter. We know the slope um, calculated from any of those points will be the same because the slope is the same along a given line. I like A and C because I see in their Y terms that there's both fifths, right? So to me, that, that'll probably be a little bit easier. We know that their X values are also both whole numbers, so the math there might be a little, a little less tricky. So let's call A, let's call this one our X1. Let's call this one our x1, y1, and we'll call this uh, c, we'll call this our x2, comma y2. And let's plug this in. So we know m is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We plug in what we got in. Our y2 is 3 fifths minus our y1 is negative 27 fifths over our x2, which is 9. Minus our x1, which is negative 6. So let's go through this and see what we get. So up top, we got 3 fifths minus negative 27 fifths. We have like denominators, right? Common denominators. So we can just do the um, operation within the numerators. So we have 3 minus negative 27. Minus a negative means that we're adding. So we're really adding 3 to 27. 3 plus 27 gives us 30. So up top, we see that we'll have 30 over 5. We know that that will simplify. We'll do that in the next step. 30 over 5 is our value in the numerator. Our value in the denominator, 9 minus negative 6. Once again, subtracting a negative means we're actually adding these two numbers. So 9 plus 6 gives us 15. 
let's let's make sense of this. So 30 over 5, that numerator value simplifies as 6 over 15 in the, in the denominator. That is our slope. Hopefully this number jumps out to us as one that can be simplified. We know a common factor between these two numbers is 3. If we divide 6 by 3, we get 2. And if we divide 15 by 3, we get 5. So our slope here is 2 fifths. And once again, always try and take that number and take it back to your original, take it back to what you're visually given. I mean, we know in the geometry section, a lot of times they say, oh, well, this isn't drawn to scale. I mean, this should be drawn to scale. And as long as the, um, the scales of the X and Y axes make sense, then we should be able to see, okay, well, does this value fit this slope? So we saw that we found out that our slope was two fifths. Two fifths, once again, it's positive. So we should be trending upward. We are. As we go from left to right, it goes upward. <clears throat> and once again, two fifths less than one. Two fifths is about 0.4. So compared to one, it's, it's a little bit less than half. But I mean, not super flat, definitely flatter than a slope of one. But yeah, two fifths, that makes sense. So the slope of line T, two fifths, sounds good. Okay, that was page 50. One more. So this one. That's about parallel lines and the relationships of slopes between parallel lines. So number eight says, which of the following equations represents a line that is parallel to the line with the equation y is equal to negative three x plus four? So we said not uh, two questions ago, we said that with uh, perpendicular lines, the slopes are opposite and reciprocal. With parallel lines, the slopes are equivalent. So parallel lines. Slope is equivalent. We're going to say that this was the equation of some line um, M, and let's say let's say line A. In the slope, and we're going to say we're going to look for another line um, B. So in the slope of line A, A sub M would be equal to the slope of line B, B sub M. Yeah. So slope of line A, what is it? Well, we're in y equals mx plus b form. That makes this a lot easier for us. As you can see, this aligns perfectly with mx plus b. So our value for m here is this negative third. It's the coefficient on our x term. So m in this equation is negative three. So if we're looking for a parallel line, we're looking for a line that also has slope of negative three. So now we need to look between A, B, C, and D and find out which one of those also has a slope of negative three. Let's look at this first one. I'm just gonna rewrite it down here at the bottom a little bit, give me a little more room to work. So we have six X plus two Y is equal to 15. Easiest way to find slope, I think, is just to put it in Y equals MX plus B form. So I'm gonna bring six X over. I get 2y is equal to negative 6x plus 15 divided by 2 divided by 2. Once again, the dividing by the, or, or um, finding out the new y-intercept doesn't matter. We're just interested in slope here. So our y here is negative 3x plus 15 over 2. So the m here is negative three. And wow, well, once again, that's that's convenient. Our slope here was negative three. So that makes sense. Our slope there in the equation that they give us negative three slope there in that first one is negative three. They're parallel because they have equivalent slopes. So A there is our answer. Okay, so we covered circles, we covered triangles. We just did a bunch of problems there on slope. Okay, so let's look at our last section here. We're gonna do systems of equations. We are on page 88. Let's see if we can get two or three problems in here. Page 86 is where it starts. Systems of equations. Okay. Let's see, let's find a good one. These are also very classic um, SAT math problems. Let's find, um, let's look at this one here. 
page 91, number 33. They give us two equations, 4x plus y is equal to 4, and 8x plus y is equal to 5. They say if the point, the coordinate, x comma y, is the solution of the system of equations above, what is the value of x? So we need to find x here. Remember, our two primary ways of solving systems of equations are either through substitution or elimination. Depending on how your, how your equations are set up, one might uh, make more sense to do than the other. To me, especially the way they're, they're aligning these in the same um, form here, right? We have our x and y terms on the same side and our, our constant on the other. And they're also pretty friendly numbers. We see four and eight are multiples of each other y, the coefficient on both of our y terms are 1. To me, this, this problem looks like elimination. Let's do elimination. So we have 4x plus y or x plus y is equal to 4. Once again, we're looking for the value of x. And our other equation is 8x plus y is equal to 5. So if we want to do elimination, we want to eliminate the variable. We want to eliminate one of the variables. If we're looking for the value of x, let's eliminate y. So let's leave that first equation, that 4x plus y is equal to 4 that we have here. Let's leave that there. Let's manipulate that second equation. Can we multiply it by some, some coefficient, some, some value, so that we can cancel this out, cancel out that y term. If we have a value, this y here is positive one y, to cancel that out, we need a negative one y. So if we multiply that second equation here by negative one, once again, that negative one needs to get distributed to everything in there, we get a negative eight x minus y is equal to negative five. Now let's do our elimination. It's essentially like a, like a um, addition problem of, of two equations. <clears throat> so 4x plus negative 8x, we get negative 4x. The y's cancel out, which is what we wanted. That's why we set it up like that. And then 4 plus negative 5 gives us negative 1. We're solving for x, so we divide by negative 4 here. We divide by negative 4 here. x is equal to negative 1 over negative 4. We can simplify that. just becomes one over, that's all they're asking for. They didn't want the entire coordinate, so we don't need a y term. They just wanted our x term, right? So what is the value of x? There we go, x is one fourth. Let's see, maybe we can fit in one more, maybe two more. Hmm. Here we go, here's a good one. Because if the system of equations above, we'll give us our two equations, has solution x comma y, what is the value of x plus y? So in this case, we need to find both. So once again, to me, this looks like a good elimination problem. They're both on the same um, setup there. We have our x and y terms on the same side, coefficient or the constant on the other. So we could either multiply this first equation by negative two. So we get that uh, three X term to negative six and they could cancel, or we could just multiply one of them by negative one and those Y equations would, or those Y variables, Y terms would cancel. So let's do that. Let's multiply this second equation by negative one. So if we rewrite that first, bring it down here, three X plus two Y is equal to 16. That second equation multiplied by negative one now becomes negative six X minus two Y and equal to negative 28. Three X plus negative six X gives us negative three X, two Y plus negative two Y, those terms cancel. 16 plus negative 28 minus 28 gives us negative 12. So we get three X is equal to negative 12 divide by negative three here, divide by negative three here, x becomes equal to four. We have that value for x now. We can take that value and plug it into either one of our 
um, equations here. Doesn't matter. We know that um, it's a system of equations. These equations are essentially arriving at the same value. They're just, you know, set up um, in a different way. So let's take that x value, plug it into our first one here, this equation. So we have 3x plus 2y, then we rewrite it. And now we're just substituting that x value in here. So plugging that in right here. So 3 times 4, and we're solving for y, plus 2y is equal to 16. We get 12 plus 2y is equal to 16. Subtract 12, subtract 12, we get 2y is equal to 4. Divide by 2, divide by 2, y is equal to 2. Almost done. So our solution, meaning that the point at which these two intersect, that's, the, that's what the solution to a system of equation represents, is 4 comma 2. But the question is asking, what is the value of x plus y? So we want to add our x and y terms. Simple enough. x plus 4, x plus y. We set up as 4 plus 2. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 is our answer. Okay, so thanks for watching, and please remember to contact us at info and embracetutoring.com to set up any personalized private tutoring sessions you would like. Stay tuned for future videos, and best of luck with your studies. We definitely encourage you to visit our Instagram as well as TikTok pages if you have any questions along the way. Take care, guys. Best of luck with your studies.